Um, so thank you so much for having me back for day two. And I'll just apologize um, that I'm in and out both days. So forgive me if I um, don't acknowledge uh, things that people have already said. Um, but, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist by training. And so it's probably no surprise to many of you that I think mental health is um, really central to what we need to be thinking about for um, autistic adults, both in terms of services and supports, as well as research. So we know that mental health is a is and should be a priority for autistic adults. So we have many studies now that show higher prevalence rates of depression, anxiety, and suicidality in autistic individuals across the lifespan. And that for adults, these are higher than in the general population. The specific numbers really vary depending on the specific sample that you're looking at, but we're talking about a third to a half. And in some studies, two thirds to three quarters of autistic individuals experiencing clinically significant mental health problems at some point in their life. And if you talk to autistic adults, this is a study led by Teal Benavides, who we've heard from yesterday. Um, they also list mental health as a priority for research in adulthood. And keeping in mind that this was all before COVID, and I think COVID has done many things for our, our worlds, but um, also really emphasizing the importance of mental health and well-being. And so it's no surprise either that we really need to be thinking particularly about the mental health of older adults. And so these are just two examples of things that have popped up in my email in the last week that NIH is putting on. And it's a good reminder that, um, you know, adulthood is a developmental period, but it is not one developmental period, right? That we need to specifically think about adults in autism. Research and clinical services is one thing, but all adults are not experiencing the same, um, the same difficulties throughout all of adult life, which I think the panel did a nice job of highlighting. There are different points at life where things um, get better, things are more challenging. I did a talk this morning to a group of um, individuals on, on a college campus and thinking about the challenges of college life. So, you know, we do need to remember that as people are aging and traversing middle age and, and older adulthood, um, that there are different um, and, and more specific issues that we also need to fold into consideration. As we are moving forward in thinking about autism research in the aging population of adults, we see sort of two subgroups of um, research emerging. And, and I think that Joe Piven mentioned this a little bit yesterday. But so we have existing longitudinal samples. These are like gold. They have followed individuals since childhood across multiple decades. Um, and some of, of those samples are starting to hit middle age or even some older adulthood. They tend to have higher proportions of developmental delays and intellectual disability. There's maybe greater potential for diagnostic overshadowing. So these were individuals largely diagnosed in childhood. And so they may have been um, overlooked in terms of things like anxiety or depression, having been attributed to autism as opposed to a separate or co-occurring mental health condition. And we tend to, in these samples, see many more adults who remain dependent um, on family members. And so we do also get a lot of parent reports um, from these samples. As we have started to think more about the need for adult research, there's obviously going to be more studies who are ascertaining samples right now. And a lot of these samples have really leveraged online surveys and, and um, social media to access large uh, groups of individuals who have autism diagnoses. Um, but many of these tend to be diagnosed in adulthood. So we're talking about a cohort of individuals who tend to have fewer or maybe no early supports throughout their lives. You have to think about how their mental health maybe has been affected by not having a diagnosis for the first three or four or five decades of their life. And also that the majority of these samples are self-reporting adults. And so I think um, I'm, I'm going to take us on a, a sidebar a little bit and talk about how ascertainment might affect autism research and, and particularly research on mental health. Um, so the Simons Powering Autism Research Knowledge Study, or SPARC, um, provides a kind of unique opportunity in that they have thousands of people who they have recruited. Um, we have a large cohort of 
dependent adults where we have pair reporting primarily for them. And we also have a very large group of independent adults who provide self reports. Um, and so, you know, the on the left well, is the dependent adult sample. We have a little under 3000 individuals. And this was written up by um, Dr. Eric Von Bohn, whose picture is there. And you can see that um, consistent with a lot of autism research, we have a high percentage of individuals um, who were male, uh, half, about half, had intellectual disability, um, and very few individuals were diagnosed um, after childhood, right? So, so most of these individuals were diagnosed earlier. And within this um, sort of broader sample, they had about 70 people who um, were above the age of 40. The independent adult sample, um, this is work led by, by a student of mine, Nikita Jetta. Um, it's currently under review. We've got some promising reviews, so we're hopeful it'll come out soon. Um, but for now, you know, we have um, a very large sample of, of adults who are self-reporting. Um, we find much higher proportions of females, so about 60% female to 40% male. Not surprisingly, a very low um, proportion of individuals with intellectual disability. And maybe um, not surprising to this group at, all, at least, we have a very high proportion of individuals. So 80% were diagnosed after the age of 21 in that 40 plus group and, and about a third in the 18 to 39 group. So this gives us some unique opportunity to think about how differently ascertained samples, um, all to one study for a similar purpose, but different subgroups of individuals who are coming to research um, how, how we might uh, learn about their mental health. So this is the, um, a lot of numbers and, and you don't really need to digest all the numbers, but on the left here is that dependent adult that was published um, in JAD by Dr. Fombone. And this is the unpublished data that we're working on in the independent sample. Um, and so all of the participants are asked on an online survey, please select all of the conditions that you or your child slash dependent has been diagnosed with by a professional. So I'll highlight, this is a major limitation in that we don't know exactly when they were diagnosed with these other conditions, but, um, but they were supposed to have been diagnosed by a professional. And if we sort of broadly compare um, the two subgroups, the self-reporting independent adults to the parent-reported dependent adults, we generally see quite a bit higher rates of psychiatric conditions being reported by the independent adults. And so, you know, this is anxiety, um, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, bipolar, hoarding, eating personality, and schizophrenia. And so we see, you know, in anxiety, for example, and social anxiety, about one and a half to two times higher in the independent self-report sample. The only um, uh, diagnosis for which this was not true was obsessive compulsive disorder, where we see actually a, a little bit higher in the older age group um, in the dependent adult sample. If we do a deeper dive just into that independent adult self-reporting sample, we see age effects. And you'll forgive me, I, I've collapsed a bunch of age groups that were, we've compared um, just for your own sort of being able to sort of visually digest some of this. Um, but what we saw was that there were age effects across a number of different diagnoses if we compare all of these different sort of groupings of ages. Um, so 18 to 19 year olds, 20 to 24 year olds, et cetera. And we find that for many diagnoses, so social anxiety, depression, hoarding, personality, a lot of the age effect is really driven by lower rates in the youngest group, that 18 to 19 year old transition age group. Um, and then we also see that there's lower levels of anxiety of, um, and, and bipolar in those individuals who are 40 plus as well. So um, middle age and older. And then we find in hoarding and in personality disorders um, are actually the highest rates are seen in those individuals um, and middle age or older.
So of course, we're, we're particularly interested in aging, and, and I thought it was a nice opportunity to dig into this data a little bit over the weekend to think about what do we know about this um, group of individuals who are over the age of 40. Um, and so you can see we have over 1,000 individuals, um, and, and that's a pretty big sample by way of aging research um, in autism at this point. So we see that personality disorders is the highest um, in 60 plus year olds compared to 50 year olds and 40 year olds. And then the gray is the reference of the 20 to 39 year olds. So we are seeing almost a quarter of the individuals over the age of 60. Of course, these subgroups get a little bit small, um, but, but still I think pretty striking. Um, in contrast, anxiety, generalized anxiety, we actually see is the lowest in the oldest individuals. And that was pretty surprising. You know, there are lots of interesting things to think about, um, you know, why that might be, but, um, but that's the age effect that we're seeing in this particular sample. And then in bipolar, we're also seeing sort of the lowest um, uh, diagnosis rate in, in the 50, 59 year olds, um, given the sort of actual differences in those proportions, it's probably, um, you know, kind of a, a cohort ascertainment rather than something particularly meaningful. And again, keeping in mind that we don't know exactly when these individuals receive these diagnoses, just that some professional at some point has told them that they have one of these mental health conditions. And so one of the things that we were really interested in though is how does the age of diagnosis um, affect the number or the frequency of, of these different conditions that we might see? And so in this sample, remember we had a very high proportion of individuals who were diagnosed after the age of 21. Um, and this is across the whole age range. This is no longer just the oldest group. Um, and so we saw that about 40% of males and about 50% of females were diagnosed later. And that generally speaking, those later diagnosed adults reported more lifetime diagnoses than those who were diagnosed with autism earlier. And these are just the comparisons. So the red bars are those diagnosed as adults and the gray bars were those diagnosed prior to the age of 21. And we see higher rates of anxiety, social anxiety, OCD, depression, um, as well as personality disorders based on, again, all self-reporting adults on their own um, psychiatric diagnoses, but split up by the time that they report they received their autism diagnosis. So I think a big takeaway is that we need to be very careful when we are comparing findings across different samples. And I think, um, you know, Dr. Blair's work that was just um, shown is a good example, right? Like you have these sort of confusing findings cross-sectional compared to longitudinal studies. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think we need to think about this as we're moving forward. We have these really valuable longitudinal studies we have, um, you know, that are primarily adults who are ascertained as young children um, and who are obviously identified as being on the autism spectrum when they were quite young. And then we have these adults who are coming in and getting first time diagnoses, like many of our panel members, much later in life. And so we really need better studies to really understand what is driving the difference between these different cohorts of individuals or these different samples. So, you know, some of it could be something about parent versus self report in that dependent adult sample, with lower rates of psychiatric conditions. I'm always really worried that we are under diagnosing or under recognizing depression and anxiety disorders in those individuals who are minimally verbal or have intellectual disabilities. Um, and then I think in the, in the self-report and in the independent adult samples, we need to think about why is it that the timing of autism diagnosis is affecting the rates of psychiatric conditions? So some of these things might have been misdiagnoses prior to them getting their autism diagnosis. Um, but, you know, are these wrong diagnoses that were given by someone who didn't know that um, the features were better explained by autism? Or were they co-occurring diagnoses that maybe um, sort of overshadowed the autism diagnosis? And, and, and potentially even contributed to the delays in, in autism diagnosis. And then I think also the effects of being missed or being misdiagnosed. What are the mental health implications for going through a large part of your life feeling different, being treated as different, um, and not having a diagnosis to contextualize some of that 
um, those features and, and to understand some of the challenges and access some of the supports that you might need. So if we think about moving forward, how do we address the mental health needs of aging adults? And so I, I thought that this was a good forum to really dig into thinking about what do we need to do next and, and to open these conversations of how do we really support autistic individuals across adult life um, and particularly their mental health needs. So one really big challenge I think is that clinicians out in the community, so this is from a community mental health study, um, they're identifying barriers to, to supporting autistic adults. They don't feel like they have enough knowledge or the experience, they, they're not feeling competent to support autistic individuals. This study was about adults generally, if we, we might assume this, this is even worse if we're turning to um, psychiatric care and, and geriatric psychiatry in particular, where even, even less is known about um, autism. And so the lack of providers presents more challenges. So when providers in the community are saying, I don't feel competent to support autistic individuals, autistic people are forced to go and seek specialty care. And so they are in the autism clinics, which often focus primarily on children, maybe up to 21, maybe up to 25, these services already have extremely long wait lists for diagnoses and other kinds of supports. And actually, if you talk to a lot of autism um, specialty clinicians, they really feel like they lack the expertise in adult mental health diagnosis and treatment. So they are not prepared to make differential diagnoses between personality disorders and really significant anxiety disorders, et cetera. Um, the, the kinds of differentials we're thinking about in adults because they have been trained in, in pediatric care and thinking more more about developmental um, conditions and, and differentials. And so then, you know, this contributes further to more people being missed or having, you know, inaccurate diagnoses. And certainly the co-occurrence of multiple conditions like anxiety and autism and, and or depression and autism adds to the complexity of establishing what diagnosis actually is accurate or makes sense for the person. Certainly the delays in autism diagnosis can contribute to depression anxiety. And in, in so far as we have people sitting on wait lists trying to access services um, and they're not getting the appropriate mental health supports, then symptoms further worsen and, and they need uh, even a higher level of care. And then just in case I haven't depressed you enough, um, these issues are further exacerbated by a lack of evidence-based measures and treatments. So if we look to the treatment literature, this is a little bit of an older study. This is Weston in 2016, found 24 cognitive behavioral therapy studies targeting mental health um, in autism, only uh, more than half of those. So 15 of those focused on targeting anxiety. Um, about half were actually randomized controlled trials. Only seven of them included adults, three of which I think were teen and adults. So very few studies were really thinking about the full range of mental health supports that were needed. Um, and, you know, I think uh, Susan White had a paper and, and really pointed out to us that we assume things like CBT would be beneficial for depression because there's a really strong evidence base for CBT to treat depression in the general population, but we actually have pretty limited direct evidence. And if we're thinking about assessment and diagnosis and, and trying to identify those individuals who really need mental health supports, there's some psychometric support for common depression and anxiety measures, things like the patient health questionnaire, the Beck depression inventory, et cetera. But we really need more work to test and adapt measures and treatments, particularly for those individuals um, who are minimally verbal or who have intellectual disability, but also for individuals across different points of their adult life where we're really focusing in and honing in on the issues that they're experiencing um, in that developmental period. And then finally, um, I wanted to uh, sort of wrap up and I'll, I'll just sort of put out there, and I don't think that these are innovative ideas. I think these are things that we're all sort of thinking about, but I, I wanted to kind of lay out, um, you know, in, in the um, spirit of talking about systems yesterday, how do we come at this challenge? How do we help to build the supports um, that autistic individuals need and thinking about multiple different players in this larger system of mental health um, care? So if we think about educators, 
we really need to challenge the specialty care model. And I wanna be clear, I do think that there are many individuals that do require specifically trained clinicians, um, maybe particularly in diagnostics, but, and, but also in treatment. So people who really know autism in a really comprehensive and in-depth way. So I'm not saying that we can't have specialty care, but I think we really need to challenge the idea that all autistic individuals need to access things like mental health supports through a specialty care service. And, and I think one way to think about doing this is to increase autism training in mental health fields. Not everyone has to be an autism specialist, but everyone should be getting a general level of autism training, much the way every psychologist or every social worker gets some training in assessment and treatment for depression and assessment and treatment for anxiety and thinking about uh, autism and other um, neurodevelopmental disorders as part of that training to promote better mental health care um, for these individuals. At the clinician level, so for those of us who are out there kind of and, and working directly with people, um, I, I think a lot of people feel really strongly, gosh, like I have these growing wait lists and I just can't ever sort of dig my way out of that. And it can be very frustrating. Um, and so thinking about partnering within our communities to develop models for consultation so that when a clinician has a referral, um, an adult who's on the spectrum and wants some additional support or information about approaching, or maybe had trouble, you know, midway through treatment and, and needs some consultation, that we have models set up to support those clinicians um, just in the way we consult on other kinds of issues that aren't autism. So um, we already have, you know, many different groups thinking um, using the ECHO model. We have um, I think different clinics sometimes have multi-specialty teams. So you have your autism expert and your ADHD expert and, and your um, you know, CBT anxiety expert and everyone's sort of working together and, and seeing a variety of different people, but you have a team built in to consult. And similarly, I think increasing um, you know, group private practices and, and consultation with local university experts, et cetera. And so really thinking about how do we get people who are already out there providing supports and services, um, the, the tools and information that they need. From a research perspective, I think there, it's clear we need to do more to both test and adapt to both existing measures for de um, depression and anxiety and other mental health problems, um, as well as different evidence-based treatments, thinking about multi-specialty collaboration. So I, I loved what um, Braden was talking about earlier about um, you know, having an autism person and an anxiety person. That's also an approach that we've sort of taken in, in trying to develop some new programs. And then as I highlighted earlier, we really need to think about these ascertainment issues as well as the needs at different ages. Um, and, and I think you know, one obvious one in particular is as people are getting older, depression seems to be much more prevalent and we have so few tools to treat or um, support individuals on the autism spectrum who are also depressed. They are out there, but I think building the evidence base that will help to support people um, and, and the resources that will support the clinicians in order to uh, implement that care. From a funding perspective, and you know, I'm not a funder, so maybe this is um, this is just hopeful optimism. Um, but you know, I, I think the funding for ongoing longitudinal studies is so so critical, and and to realize all that goes into these funding applications and the gaps that we experience if you are trying to put in a um, you know and, and are then asked for revisions and multiple times and the precious sort of data points that you lose in that process. Um, so thinking about how do we keep these longitudinal studies, which are really invaluable, how do we keep them going um, and, and support them and, and realizing the importance of each of those data points across different developmental stages of adulthood. Um, you know, obviously I, I'm a big proponent for funding mental health within autism specifically, and there's been a lot of attention to that recently, but also figuring out the training mechanisms and how to really um, support new investigators at all levels from graduate all the way up to early career um, in, in being able to link specialties and, and also to disseminate all of this important work.
And then, you know, something that has come up more recently is to think about really challenging autism as an exclusion from other studies. Um, and, And I don't know how much this actually happens in aging research, but I know from my colleagues who do um, child and and youth mental health research that autism is often one of the first things that they exclude from their randomized control trials. Um, And and I think they they find different ways to justify that. But I think considering the prevalence of autism, considering the high demands and needs right now that are not being met, we really need to challenge whether that is acceptable um, and, and to think about that sort of more broadly. And then from a policy standpoint, um, you know, I, I think we need policymakers to really reconsider service eligibility. So I will give you a specific um, example. We have a, a young man here who has state supported services um, and his father passed away and he really needed mental health supports, but he could not use his state provided DDD budget to access mental health care. He could use it for ABA, he could use it for community-based support, he could not use it to fund Um, psychological therapy. So that's a huge problem. And, you know, I think um, oftentimes, you know, so there were some negotiations around what we might be able to do to support him and and how, um, you know, differences in in how different types of providers are are reimbursed. And and I think that those systems create real barriers to care for people. Um, And, you know, I think building on the conversation from yesterday, addressing those systemic issues um, that exist to really promote equitable access. Somewhat, one of the, the panel members really emphasized this, and I, I think it's true. This is a, a public health problem in, when there are whole groups of people who cannot access the services that they need. And so, you know, just a, a quick plug for, you know, some local things that we're trying to do in these sorts of directions. We have a, a number of classes that focus specifically on autism in adulthood. Um, and, uh, you know, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level, we're trying to put out more papers and, and partner more with uh, clinicians in the community to help them develop and, and understand how to use the treatments that they already know really well um, and implement those with autistic individuals. And then we have collaborators within, um, you know, who have created programs. These are both behavioral activation programs, um, one to treat depression and intellectual disability that we're adapting for individuals on the autism spectrum, a graduate student who just got funding from Autism Science Foundation to adapt measures to assess um, depression and minimally verbal adults, and then thinking about scaling programs for youth up to um, to adults and, and thinking about how group-based um, trans diagnostic programs can be useful to support the range of mental health needs rather than focusing on individual programs. Um, so that is all for today. And thank you again for, for the opportunity to, to come and, and be a part of this group. And I've learned a lot and I'm looking forward to, to catching up on the recordings as well.